Hey guys, welcome to Jerry's Live. As always, I'm your host, Amy Gardner-Dean. Today we've got Color Theory 201, How to Talk the Talk. We're going to go over hues, values, chroma, tints, shades, the whole nine yards. Uh, it is episode JL97, so if you're playing along at home and want to see the supply list, you can actually go to the jerryzartorama.com website. You can type in those keywords, just the JL97, hit enter and that'll pop that whole kind of list of the things we've got out here on the table anyway up. Um, so if there's a certain color that you see that you really like, uh, you know, one of the, the color mixing guides, anything, you'll have an easy quick way to find it. So it is there. Um, we did a color theory 101 in, uh, was it January or February? End of January, I think, wasn't it? Um, so we're going to very quickly just like breeze over the highlights of that. So that if you happen to miss that or you're one of our newer viewers that's not aware that you can go back and watch episodes after they've aired online, either on our YouTube channel for Jerry's Artorama or on Facebook, um, at our Jerry's Artorama Facebook page. We've got all those old episodes cataloged from number one all the way to, to when this is done today. So 97 episodes for you to be able to watch. Those will be there. Um, so we'll go over this very quickly, but if there's something that you have a question about as far as what we're going over first, just go ahead and go back to that episode and view it and, and take a look. See the episode that was JL88 was our first one. So you can go back and get kind of the, the much more slowed down version of the color wheel and some basic color theory there if you want it to be kind of not the Cliff's Notes version <laughs> for what we're going to be doing um, today. And then we'll start getting into kind of all the the technical jargon on what all those other things are hues values tints chroma shades and tones okay so we'll go ahead and get started um if you can pull up the overhead we'll start with that color wheel that we had last time we've got our primary colors right we've got red yellow and blue now some people do the you know the um cyan the kind of process yellow and the magenta Whichever way you do it, that's kind of your basic three colors that you're starting with mixing. So those are the colors that we're going to be doing. Now, when we did this, we did use the Soho set um, that'll be in the JL88 uh, online notes for that. Then we've got our secondary colors. Secondary colors are the ones that you actually have to have those primaries to mix with. You cannot make those primaries on your own. All right. So we've got our blue and yellow obviously make green, our red and blue, violet, our uh, red and yellow make that nice orange, all right? Then after secondary colors, we go to tertiary colors. Now tertiary colors are when you take that primary and a secondary that's next to it and you mix those, you've got a blue green made by the blue and the green we've got a nice yellow um, green made by our yellow and green now with these you're going to uh if you've got yellow and you've got green the color that you're going to say people are always like is it green yellow is it yellow green whatever the primary is is what that first name is going to be on the color okay so we've got our yellow and our orange they make yellow orange because yellow is that primary uh, the red and the orange make a red orange a red violet's made by violet and red, and a blue violet is made by violet and blue. Okay, so you've got your primaries, your secondaries, and your tertiaries all go into making that entire wheel that we've got there. All right, so then uh, we've got the uh, warm versus cool colors. How do you know what's warm, what's cool? We're gonna split it right here down the middle, okay? Cool colors are, think water, think earth, think, you know, things that grow, things that nurture growth, like the water. Calm, coolness, serenity, water, night, cool colors are generally associated with. Your warm colors, you've got your reds through to your yellow green, energy, warmth, or heat, brightness, action, movement, okay? Lift this back off here. 
Then we've got our color schemes in painting. We've got complementary colors. Complementary colors are colors that are crossed from each other on that color wheel. So red and green are crossed from each other. The violet and yellow are across from each other. We've got orange and blue across from each other. We've got red, violet, and yellow, green across from each other. Anytime you take those complementary colors and you use them to base your color scheme on it, I'm not saying those are the only two colors that you can use when you're painting, base your color scheme on it. And you don't have to make them bright screaming, you know, like this, you can kind of tone them down. It gives a very nice, strong contrast if you pay attention the next time you're driving down the road in a major U.S. city. Pay attention to advertising signs. You will find a lot of complementary color schemes in those. Then we've got our split complementary color scheme. So I'm going to go to our green there. Our split complementary color scheme would be you take one of those colors and then you go to the complement across from it and split it. That's why it's called the split complementary color. So green would be a red orange and a red violet. It's a little bit more subtle version of the complementary color scheme. You can move that around. So if you had your orange, you would have the blue violet and the blue green, okay? Just a little bit more subtle, incorporates a little extra color in there. Um, that's a very nice color scheme to use. Then we've got our triadic color scheme. The three that have kind of three colors between them, okay? So your primaries are a triadic color scheme. Your secondaries, if you turn it, are a triadic color scheme. Your tertiaries are a triadic color scheme. Or kind of tweaking that anywhere in between, that can be a triadic color scheme. It is three evenly spaced colors. Now what that does is it's supposed to make a bright and dynamic color scheme, makes for harmony yet simultaneous contrast. Now, uh, lost my analogous color scheme. Oh, there it is. Ran away. The analogous color scheme, we are taking three to four colors along that same side. So if we've got a kind of this, uh, Red violet here it would be, or excuse me, red, it'd be red, red orange, orange, and yellow orange. Can be three to four. I've even seen some people use it as five. You can just kind of tell it's kind of along one portion of that color wheel. So we can move that anywhere here. What that does is that's going to give a specific feel to it. Uh, one color is supposed to dominate one support and one accent. Uh, it kind of helps convey the mood. It shows emotional tone in a work. Obviously, you're not going to be, you know, using all four in equal amounts. Kind of use one to kind of set your major part of the work and use the other colors to accent that. Then we've got our tetradic color scheme. That is a double complementary color. Um, it's the most varied. You can use the two complementary color pairs. It's very hard to harmonize. You do not, again, want to use that in equal amounts. Choose one as the dominant, and then you want some pops or those colors maybe subdued, maybe kind of grayed down slightly so that one is kind of the dominant and then you've got your other ones there. It doesn't matter which way you do this. This is just got it. So with this one, we've got our red and violet and green and yellow. You could pick, you know, green as your main color and then the other one's kind of more softly in there, okay? All right, so if there's any part of that that you kind of want to have a little bit longer description and discussion of, it's JL88 again. Um, we talked about pigments and why those are so important in color mixing. Not all colors, just because it's called lemon yellow, let's say, if it's a cadmium lemon yellow, then it's made out of cadmium. Then it is a single pigment color. You want to start getting used to looking on your tubes here. This says PG7. That is a green pigment, pigment green 7 for PG7. That's a single pigment color. 
If you pick up some greens, like a dark green, maybe it might have two, three, four pigment numbers in it because it's taking different pigments to make that color that darker green. The less pigments in that mix, the cleaner that it's going to mix, the brighter kind of and more rich the color. The more pigments you've got in it, kind of the muddier it's going to get when you start mixing it in with other colors because those colors reflect on different wavelengths. So the more of them you put in together, the more it's going to be kind of jumping all around. Um, and kind of, if you've ever done a lot of color mixing and all of a sudden the colors just don't look right, they're very dull appearing, that a lot of times is what you're dealing with. Uh, we talked about the Art is Creation website. Um, it's just like it sounds, www.artiscreation.com. That's a pigment database. You can research your paints that you've got at home to kind of get familiar with what the different paint pigments are in them. Um, and then that can kind of help you make better buying decisions if your brand that you, you know, really like a lot happens to be out. You can look at the technical notes on a different brand and just make sure, yes, that is the same exact pigment that I've been using. All right. Um, we talked about color temperature for mixing. With the episode, we swatched all these colors that we've got here in front of us. Actually, let's see if it seems so wrong to have the cool colors on the left, Katie. Um, so we took these. These were all single pigment colors. We talked about the color temperature to them. This is a much kind of oranger, warmer yellow than say this lemon yellow. That's a much cooler, almost, you can see kind of where it scraped the paper, a little bit more green in there um, by difference to that. You can see that this quinacridone magenta here has kind of a bluish undertone. So it's a much cooler kind of magenta than the primary magenta it is much, much more hot. It's much more red. Um, another kind of the blues, it's very easy to see. <laughs> These are two phthalo blues. <coughs> one says blue-green and one says red. Sometimes it'll say B-S, uh, which means blue shade. Uh, sometimes it'll say R-S, which means red shade. You can see this is much more blue-green here. This has kind of some red undertones. It's the same pigment, but it's been kind of chemically altered to appear a little bit differently. Um, they can do things with heat, they can do things with cool, they can process the color longer. There's all sorts of different tricks they can get to take a color that's the one pigment and make it look like multiple different colors. Um, you can see in our ultramarine blue, that's got a lot of red in it. This has a lot of violet in it in the deep ultramarine. Um, it's just how that color refracts to the eye, okay? So we went over all that. The reason that's gonna be important when we start mixing color is that if you wanna make a really nice green, you're gonna need a yellow and a blue if you don't have that green, right? So what you're gonna to wanna to do to make that so that it works really well and makes a much kind of cleaner, prettier green, you're gonna want that more greenish yellow, that lemon yellow, and then you're gonna want something like a phthalo blue-green or the ultramarine blue that's kind of a greener color. You're not gonna want one that airs more on that red because it's not gonna make a very clean looking green. So you need to pay attention to that with your colors when you go to mix them. Um, obviously this quinacridone magenta would be much better to mix with a reddish blue, like maybe a deep ultramarine that's kind of got those violet undertones if I was wanting to create a really nice violet color. Okay, so color temperature is as important as it, rather than it just being, is it a primary color? What well, may be a primary color, but that doesn't mean that it's the perfect color for what you're wanting to use for mixing. All right. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yes, well, Amanda. You're sort of on, you're gonna have a repeat. No, I'm I know, yeah, you've volume. got a cold, so. Um, while you're sort of on pigments, Brennan, our friend, um, asks about the longevity between like real and synthetic and cad cadmium when it comes to those kinds of colors. If it, as far as how long they will still be around the longevity, 
Mm, probably the color purity, I would guess, or like the vibrancy. Okay, so um, Brennan Day has asked us a really good question about color. And what he's asked is kind of with cadmiums, with some of the earth tones like the iron oxides and things, kind of, I guess, what is that going to do for color longevity? Those are, those type of earth tone pigments I personally find. I like using them for color mixing, but I think a lot of the newer colors, like the phthalos and things like that, give color like a little bit more kind of that punch in your face um, kind of color management. If you can tame them, it's one of those things where if you've never done a lot of color mixing and you just jump right into buying giant tubes of phthalo and think that you're going to master color mixing with phthalo, phthalo is so pigment strong you're going to want tiny little bits of that to add. Like if you're going to make, say, uh, a yellow or a, a green and you're using your thalos, your thalo blues, and then you're using that lemon yellow, you're going to want mostly lemon yellow and to introduce little bits of that blue. So it's something where kind of the, the cadmiums and some of the iron oxide pigments and stuff are a little bit kind of easier as, on the reliability scale for learning mixing with. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try those other ones just don't don't mix large amounts of paint on a grand scale without first being sure that it's going to work well. It's fine to take a paintbrush and take some little dabs of paint and mix a practice color. You might waste a tiny bit of paint, but if you squirt out half of the tube of, of you know this yellow and half of the tube of this blue and expect that that's going to make actually the color that you want, you're going to have just wasted a lot of paint and ha need to add a whole lot more yellow. Okay, so it's fine to practice on small scale. It's fine to just practice on something to, you know, do some swatching when, when you're learning just to kind of have a better handle on how those pigments are going to perform and take notes. It doesn't mean anything if you go back to this later and you've done all this practice and you're feeling really confident and you didn't take notes as far as to what the actual colors were that you used and even percentages that you used. Not helpful, because unless you have just a really good memory or like kind of almost that idiot savant like feel for color, you're not gonna be able to just duplicate it immediately, if that makes any sense. If Brennan wants to add anything more to that, Brennan is a colorist, so tell him to feel free to add in um, what he would like to add in on that. You said just don't eat them either. Brennan, we know that's your problem. It's okay. You can just say, I'm Brennan Day and I consume color. <laughs> and tape. That man goes through so much tape. So if you guys met us at the gallery, that's, that's Brennan who talked to us about uh, working with the gallery. All right. So um, let's go and we'll start kind of mixing color and having fun. Okay. And learning some terms. If I, I, I said in the description to this, if you sit down with a cup of coffee or tea and take some notes, that's a good idea. If you don't have that out to do that now, you can come back through this and kind of mark the point how far along we are so you can kind of come back to it later. Um, because some of these terms are confusing and even sometimes for people that, that studied, it's like things can mean different things. Now hue especially is what we're gonna talk about first. That's something that people always assume, oh yeah, that means, um, you know, I've got a, a cadmium, you know, yellow hue. That's what you mean by hue, right? No, hue means two different things in art. And unless you're talking about a pigment specifically, it means that it's pure color, okay? So if this is a cadmium yellow, uh, lemon yellow, and it is the real thing, this is a cadmium yellow hue, right? This is the hue of this color. This is that bright, straight out of the tube saturation. This is what you're going to get when you use this color. Now, the other meaning for that is if I had this and it was made with lab created pigments so that, you know, if you've, if you've got health issues, if you've got kids or pets around the house that might try to eat your paint, if you've got, you know, a health issue where you're, you're gonna be putting this in something and spraying it, you probably don't wanna use the cadmiums. You're going to want to use kind of a lab synthesized group of pigments that look very similar to this in mass tone, but are not actual cadmium pigments. And those are gonna be called, when they 
label that paint, they're gonna call it a cadmium yellow hue. So you can look at those. This is going to be, uh, and of course the sticker is around the thing, so. Should be, it should it's probably a uh, pigment yellow 35, but I'm not sure. The Yeah, this probably is on that. So you're gonna look at that and it's gonna be different pigments. Look them up on the Artist Creation website. It's fine to know what you're dealing with and kind of what that pigment is made out of. It'll give you the general light fastness too for that pigment in the different kind of mediums, whether it's oil, whether it's acrylic or what have you. And it, your tube, if it's a professional quality paint, should also have light fastness ratings on that as well. Okay, so that is gonna be the hue. So, free to pick a color. Blue. Always gonna be blue. You and your blue, do you want ultramarine or phthalo? Phthalo. What Katie said? Uh, the blue green or the blue red? Red. Okay. It's a All right. So, and we, uh, pick a different so color. all right, it's gonna be all right. So we're gonna do, whoa, that light jumped right out. We'll we'll do this with two colors, okay? We'll do both the phthalo blue red and the blue green because as we mix, you'll be able to kind of see that color difference. All right, golly, and I don't have pliers to get this. I got it. Okay, so. Now, that's the hue of that color right out of the tube. Let's put them here so I know what's what. Okay. So that's the one. Let's keep a different palette knife for the other side. I, I went to actually mix them together, Frida, and then my head said, whoa, don't do that. So, yeah. You, you know that's me, right? And now my black jeans have blue paint. <laughs> because somehow the apron didn't catch so that. Long. I know. All right. So I don't know if you can see on your monitors, this is much more violet. This is much more <coughs> green looking. Okay. So chroma, the next term that we're going to learn, is the saturation intensity or purity of a color. It's not been softened. It's not had white added. It's not had black added. It's not been thinned down to a glaze. This is the chroma of the color, right? Full throttle, a nice thick kind of schmear of color right there. All right. Now you can alter that chroma by adding different amounts of a neutral gray. So you can soften that. So do we want to see what happens when we soften it? Don't look so enthusiastic for you. The baby was sleeping. Last night. Mm. Has what, a two year old? It's almost yeah. three. Yeah, so that happens. Whoop. Yeah. All right, so I've got some titanium white. I've got a little bit of carbon black. Gonna make a neutral gray here. Swap a little. Um, feel like I'm gonna just put a big blob of this out here so I can grab some. If people have questions while we're doing this, just chime in. Okay. After our palette knife episode last week, I feel like using this plastic knife is a sad thing. <laughs> it's just not as, because metal knives just really make kind of picking it up and scooping it. All right. Okay, so we've got like a nice neutral gray here, right? So I'm gonna put a little here and I'm gonna put a little some here. This is probably not the smartest way to do this. All right. Now, this is, you're going to be 
beholding the power of the phthalo blue. She's a monster. In the, uh, and kind of what this is going to do. Wow, much harder to scoop this up with the. <clears throat> okay. Can we see that difference in chroma change with that gray? Oh, wow. Can you guys see that? Let me get the other one here. Everything over so we can see you mixing. Yeah. So that you're gonna mix on the white. Do I just say anything? Um, I, mean? I thought about it, but then it's paper, and I didn't want to make a big mess with. Is that? Can you guys see it all? This is not. I'm gonna use a whole white paper over a little bit if you want. There we go. All right. Can you can't explain what you meant by a glaze when you mentioned Glaze that means that if you thinned this out with a medium or, you know, some water or something like that, you're you're actually taking the paint and you're extending it, right? To make it thin. Um, is what I meant with that. It's not gonna be that straight up front, you know, bright color. That's just right out of the tube. Do transparent colors differ when it comes to oils versus acrylics, or do they work basically the same? Way? It's the pigment. It's not the. It's the not binder. the actual binder itself. <laughs> it's a gouache would be, right? Because a gouache is opaque. We repeat your question. Okay. They asked. They asked if transparent colors are going to be the same, um, with acrylic to oils. It's. It's. If it's a transparent color in one, it's going to be the other because it's the pigment itself. It's not the binder, right? Because you've got clear resin in the acrylic, and then you've got that, you know, nice kind of clear oil that makes it even more jewel-like for your oil medium. So it's going to be that way either way. The only time it's not going to be transparent is if it's got opacifiers in it like a gouache, right? Because gouache is, is opaque and it's matte. All right, can we see what that looks like? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's, see how this is much more kind of blue-green and then this is really red, kind of a deep reddish violet. Now, with this, we also did something where we actually made this a tone, okay? In taking that chroma and kind of softening that chroma, we added gray, we added some titanium white, we added some carbon black, that's actually the definition of a tone is the hue itself with gray it desaturates the color the saturation is that bright richness of that hue right out of the tube it's desaturated that it's taken it down it's made it kind of softer not as rich not so much punch okay so let's do that same thing with the actual color itself and just with white that will be a tint Wipe these knives off so we don't get a bunch of cross color. Mess up. Okay, I'm going to put on here a pen. All right, so I'm going to put tone. All right, and this is the phthalo, oh, the phthalo blue, and this is the red shade. <clears throat> okay, that, can you guys see that all right? Kind of, a little bit. Not the fattest marker. Sorry about that. So what I had in my pocket. All right. And now I'm stuck to the paper towel. All right, if you've got any other questions while I'm just cleaning this up to, I mean, I guess I could mix right on the paper with the white and the, Mom, 
Dolly's wondering what light fasteners one means. It depends on what each manufacturer's. Okay, the she wanted to know what light fastness one means. This is the, we can talk about light fastness at another time, but it depends on the manufacturer. Different manufacturers have different ratings. Some use the blue wool scale, some use the regular scale. So typically, with most light fastness one means that it is. 100 plus years, but it just depends on that scale that the manufacturer is using. You need to actually pull the color chart for that manufacturer. That's something that on our website, we've got color charts attached to most of our brands, um, or you can Google it as well, and usually it'll come up. Read and look and see, you know, what the manufacturer is that you're looking for. Okay, this is gonna be our tint. Okay, notice I've not put out equal amounts of the, the phthalo with the white because why? What did we say about the phthalo? That it punches? So it punches, yes. It's got a lot of punch to it. So there's no reason for us to put out equal amounts because it will overpower that white. Even though the titanium white, the whites, uh, titanium versus zinc, titanium is the most opaque. Between the two, zinc is a transparent mixing white, so it'll make nice soft colors, but it's easily overpowered, so you know your titanium may work better with colors like the phthalo that punch you in the face. I'm getting more paint on me. What the what? Frida, you're looking fascinated like this is all. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Okay. Can everybody see kind of what those... See how this is much more kind of almost like a blue-violet, almost like a periwinkle, and then this one is definitely a lot brighter. Yes, no, maybe so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so then we're going to do the shade. We're, shade is that hue, but with black in it. So okay. Mary is wondering if the intensity can be... There's anything that makes the intensity more, or if basically what you get out of the tube is as intense as it's can You were not, okay, so that's a good question, Mary. What, she said, what can you do, is there anything that you can do to make the intensity stronger out of the tube than what it is? These colors are going to be what they are. Obviously, by lightening them, it depends on if you're looking for a value shift where it's lighter and brighter and has that power. Or you're looking for it to be darker but typically whenever you're going to add black it tends to dirty colors um, do this. Um, the, the issue with that is that uh, instead of just kind of darkening them you're you're adding a color that blacks aren't necessarily black like Mars black is going to be your blackest black and it's going to be probably the most opaque of the blacks um, ivory and carbon black tend to give you a brown undertone um, and then lamp black tends to give you a blue undertone and those are not opaque so it can do a lot knowing that it's great if you want to actually kind of help use that to alter your color and we did an episode on um, blacks and whites all about black and white and can you see if you can find that and and put that in because we show all those different blacks and a drawdown so you can kind of see, you know, what that undertone color is for it to know where it might suit you to be able to utilize that if you're wanting to add black. Um, but you can't take a color straight from the tube and make it more vibrant. What you can do for that, Mary, is always buy artist grade paints, um, the best quality pigment that you can. 
because that's going to give you the you know that vibrancy that you're looking for as opposed to the same color in like a student grade where where maybe they're using some uh, some clear pigment inert fillers that kind of help extend that. Um, we did a show on student versus artist grade paint um, our first year, was it Katie? Um, and that's in our, if, you, if you're a member of our group, we've got the documents in the group that have all of the shows that we've got um, where you can actually look at that and it's linked to the page, correct? or linked to this episode at the top, pinned to the top always, um, where you can actually see and access that document and click on all the shows. But with the student versus artist grade pigment, we go through a color in each of the oil, in the acrylic, and in the watercolor, and we talk about like, we used lemon yellow, right, for the watercolor, Katie? Mm -hmm. And how many different products are labeled lemon yellow with completely different pigments? And then we did magenta for the, um, the quinacridone magenta, is that what we did? And then just all the colors that are labeled as that. Some that have violet pigments in it, some that have red pigments instead, some that have magenta. It's a good kind of uh, lesson in why, you know, artist grade may be a little bit more important to maybe not buy as many colors, but buy up to professional grade, um, just because you're going to kind of get the best pigment results. All right, so we got this down now where we've got our shade, right? We've got the red shade with the, where we've got the tone, which is the hue plus the gray. We've got our tint, which is our hue plus the white. And we've got our shade, which is our hue plus the black. <clears throat> Notice how that kind of loses a lot of color steam, so to speak. It's, it's just dark. It's not black, but it's not really blue either it's almost like a really deep marine blue which you could use that for a nice black you know as opposed to just a straight black but it's very dark then you've got your phthalo blue green shade where you've got your tone with the gray you've got your tint with the white and you've got your shade with the black can everybody kind of see those color differences <coughs> i think the tint is where it's definitely the most obvious in that that is much greener looking than you know this one a lot more periwinkle um now um chromatic or value so we've got a grayscale and value finder here okay with value it's how light or dark a color is as its hue okay it has nothing to do with the color itself if, if this is a good thing to always have as an artist, even I still use one of these constantly. I've got one over here, one in my office, one at home. It's got these little windows so you can kind of hold it over your color to kind of see where you're at. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna squint, okay? You're going to look and see kind of where that value lies. A 10 is your white, a one is kind of your black. And it's not meaning this is, okay, well this is blue, this isn't black. Think of this as a black and white photo, okay? You're gonna squint, you're looking at what the value is. So if I hold this up and I squint through, everybody look at this and squint, I squint through my thing and look through that little hole, that's really close, the value of that is really close to pretty much a black, right? Okay, so if I move it down here, that's changing, right? This is pretty close to that value three, even almost a value four, it's kind of in between, kind of like a half step in between. Can everybody see that? Is that making sense? I'm gonna st start singing the Talking Heads Stop Making Sense song in a second here. That's okay, Frida, I know you're tired. <laughs> okay, but this makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, that's all I wanna know. <laughs> So that's a good way to like take a color and experiment. How much, you know, how little color and how much white do you need to add to get it up to a value nine? To just, just a touch of that blue in there where it's almost just a cool white. And then kind of, it's good to actually take a color and try to mix these to get them a close value. What that's gonna do, and a lot of people are gonna be like, put that waste paint buy an inexpensive color and do this with it because it's going to train you 
how to actually add your whites or even your blacks or a chromatic black to get these to change values for your colors, okay? To kind of get used to finding it at these 10 steps. Where is it at on these 10 steps? All right. So now dark colors, they have what is called a low value. So the phthalo would have a low value. If we squeeze this lemon yellow out, it's a very light color. That would have a very high value, correct? The value on this would be, let's flatten it out so we can see it behind the card here. The value on this is going to be close to that eight, okay? If you squint, almost kind of a step between the eight and the nine, if you're squinting at those colors, okay? And it, hopefully it's not harder to see with that reflection of that because it's kind of shiny from the overhead. So what is the point of the value? The point of the value is that a lot of people just use color when they're doing, like say you're doing a still life of some apples and a vase and kind of a dark background and, and maybe a light colored tablecloth. There are people that are just paint it whatever color it is, they will never realize that they don't have enough values in it to make the back drop back because it's not dark enough to make the front come forward on that tablecloth because it's not a high enough value. So basically, if somebody were colorblind and came up and looked at a painting and they didn't have enough different values, yes. all they would see is a mass of gray. And this values are the easiest way to be able to first immediately identify because you're identifying light and dark in the painting, right? Then it can be whatever colors you want, but it's still going to be dimensional because it's going to have those light and darks and thus read as three-dimensional. Next week, we're gonna be doing a monochromatic uh, painting with oil. Monochromatic means it's just like this. We're gonna be taking one color and black and white, and we're going to be doing a painting in that. So that's when we'll really, that's why we're doing that next week, is so that we can talk about value and how you do that in a painting and how you perceive and kind of work with that in a painting. But that's why that's very important. Because a lot of people just be like, oh, it, this is the tablecloth. Let's paint it white. This isn't white. This is, if we look at this, this is a value right kind of almost in between these two if I squint. Okay? So that's like at a 7 to an 8. It's not white. It's not up at that 10. So it's judging those values that really helps. That's why I always say, are you squinting at it? When I talk to my students, squint at it and look. That's the easiest way to kind of tell. All right, now, so with the color mixing guides that we've got, we've got the Magic Palette Color Mixing Guide. And the reason that this is a really cool, see how much this looks like just like what we did? Here's our Thalo Blue. Obviously, this is a red shade because look at this. I did not plan for that, but look at how much that kind of matches those colors. Can you guys see that? Looks like a Pantone swatch on the color. This guide shows you what the color is and it'll have a little arrow with it and then like it since this is a low value with that being a nice dark color then it adds white in steps so you can see how if you take that color and lighten it by different percentages kind of where that's going to be. Does it with everything. With the cadmium yellow light like this like we put on there because this is a high value color because it's lighter it's just got one step up with the white and then it starts adding black in increments. And see how with the black, that actually turns into a green? Okay, so it does this with all sorts of colors. It's got, uh, doo -doo -doo. where's the, 36 different artist colors that it's got in this guide. So it can kind of be used as a cheat sheet of if you're adding black, what, how are those colors going to start changing and turning out? and kind of how are those values going to change as a result, okay? So that's a really cool guide. Then, Katie, if you can go up to the regular screen for just a second. We always have this color mixing guide in the back because it's a huge favorite of mine. They have this one and then they have one that like if you're in a class that's kind of, I think, about half size. So it doesn't have quite as many colors, but it, it shows them mixed together. Now, this is the ultimate color mixing kind of guide cheat sheet 
because all it's doing is like this says ivory black here. All of these colors are these colors that are mixed with ivory black. So if we look at the quinacridone uh, magenta and we go up, that's what quinacridone magenta looks like mixed with an ivory black. And it makes almost a really nice deep plum color. Okay, if we've got a phthalo blue, that's mixed with, it says dominant colors, it says mixing colors. So if we've got this really nice kind of phthalo blue and we want to mix it with just, I look at this and oh, look at, Katie would love this teal color. Oh, no, how about this one? Mm -hmm. Katie would love this teal color. That's cerulean blue. What do we take to mix with it? I look down our little handy dandy cheat sheet here. Phthalo emerald green makes that color. So it's a way to purchase a specific amount of colors and be able to make all of these colors here, which then you can darken with what? We can, we can take, take black and make a shade of these colors, shade. right? <laughs> or we can do what? What do we do to, to add white? What is it called? Tint. Tint. Yay! Oh, man, I got it. Okay. So, so we can take the white and the black and we can make those tints to make them lighter. We can make them shades to make them darker. Or we can soften the colors out and gray them by making a tone, right? By putting gray with the color in kind of whatever of these gray values you want to do. So if you want to make a really light soft gray, mix a gray like that and mix your color with it. And then that will just soften it like that, all right? So this is a tool besides a really pretty, really awesome, beautiful decoration that's always back here behind us. It's a fantastic tool for that, for, for picking and choosing color. Because when you're painting, you'll be like, oh, I love that color. How do I get that? You know, I'm painting a basket and a still life. How do I get that? Yellow ochre and cobalt blue, of all things, make that color. And you'll get to the point of when you use a guide like that, that you'll look over on the thing and you'll go, I know what colors I need to make that because it becomes second nature. If you've mixed it a few times with those colors, you can kind of knock them out really, really easy. And these are so pretty, all these earth tone colors. Yes. The little ring pack that you had. Yes. Um, Lynn was wondering if they have like the normal names of colors or if it goes by pigment or... Okay, so Lynn, Lynn, these are the colors. Cadmium yellow light, cadmium yellow medium, Naples yellow hue, which Naples yellow, you know, you could do that too. It, and it's got the actual pigment numbers on that. Okay. Yellow ochre Indian yellow, cadmium orange, cadmium red light, cadmium red medium, quinacridone red, cadmium red deep, alizarin crimson, quinacridone magenta, quinacridone violet. The list goes on and on. It's very specific colors that any manufacturer pretty much makes for the most part. Does that help? Mm -hmm. So also because I know somebody's going to ask, that giant color mixing guide is not framed. It's mounted yes. to foam core. Foam core, and, and then has a little mat. Yeah, yeah. She she just wanted to point out these don't come thick like this. They're just a regular poster, which you can either I've got mine just pinned into the wall with really large push pins, but it's just been spray mounted to foam core, and it has a nice mat so that it looks pretty and it's nice and stiff so for the 19th time I knock it down it's not being damaged so this stuff we've talked about today we are using acrylic but it can translate to oil and watercolor in mostly the same way correct this will translate to any of those mediums this will even translate to acrylic gouache to gouache the difference will be that the gouache will be opaque right and the colors tend to be a little lighter in gouache. You don't tend to get super, super, except maybe black and a few of the dark tones because those opacifiers tend to have calcium carbonate and stuff in it to help with the matting agent and the opacifiers, and it will tend to make colors slightly lighter, okay? But color theory can apply to all types of paint. And you don't need to mix as much, obviously, as I did because I'm trying to cover large amounts of area so you guys can see it easily on camera. I mean, we used these tubes and these tubes were already used from my AOC class two years in a row and they're still in that good of shape even with being used. So, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of paint. These are also artist quality paints. They're professional paints, so they're very pigment rich. So you're not having to, you know, mix huge amounts either. Right. 
Does anybody have any other questions? We can talk about chromatic blacks really quickly. Um, One of the viewers was also asking about the undertones on the black. Um, and just in general, what is the definition of undertone? An undertone is like how we're saying this is red sh These are blues, right? But one is called red shade and one is called green shade because it's got that undertone. And just like with the colors that we showed here, when we were showing that the yellow had kind of a greenish undertone with kind of the pull of the paint across, where this had a much sunnier kind of more orange undertone, the undertone is kind of, as you pull that mass tone across, as it gets thinner or in a glaze, it's kind of that kind of other color that you can see shine through it. So that's what that is. So a black that, like, think of Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray should be, you assume, a gray, right? Kind of neutral, but Payne's Gray is really blue, right? Don't you think? Everybody that's seen Payne's Gray, it's got that, and you, you add a little bit of white to it, it becomes like almost a Williamsburg blue, kind of that really grayish blue. That's what that undertone is. It's not a true gray. It's got that blue undertone to it. Um, so, I, and the carbon black, I think, is just, that's just pretty much a close to true black. So, um, take blacks that you have at home. Watch that black episode where we did the black and white episode because we show that and we talk about that in greater depth. And we also talk about warm and cool whites, too. Right, Katie? Pretty sure. So, uh, so do we want to do a quick chromatic black? Okay, so chromatic black typically uh, just means two colors that aren't black that you make to look like a black. It's got that kind of chroma, that color that kind of reads as black. It's not actually specifically black. So what two colors that work really, really, well, multiple colors that work pretty well for black. Um, I use burnt umber and a dioxazine violet a lot. This is a medium violet. Um, this is the same, this is pigment violet red, or pigment violet 23, but it's the red shade. So this is redder than the one I use. I use the deeper blue shade. But we can mix these two colors together so you can see kind of that these will read as black. And then we'll do a, uh, a blue with it. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that same burnt umber. And Charvin's uh, burnt umber to me is a not as dark of a brown as other ones, as other brands. Oops, I just put the exact same color out. All right, so we're gonna move this over with this friend. Do this with a blue. Uh, with, we'll do the phthalo blue red. So I think that'll work nice with the brown. And then we will do a green. Although this is a lighter green than I would use, we can just at least show you that it kind of makes an earth tone to uh, where it would kind of read as a black. I would go with a deeper green like a phthalo green or even a sap green and then we'll do this cad red deep let's see what we get out of that because that's a if we look at this we talked about the um kind of the hue and the kind of chroma notice how this is lighter if we're going to kind of hold that that's not going to be as black as that where these colors are darker so they're going to read more like a black Okay, so that's made more of like a darker violet. If you squint, that's got that same value of what a traditional black would be. But instead of using black, that's going to read as more of a natural tone. All right, let's clean this. We'll see what the blue with this does. From here, that would already look much darker. Mm-hmm. 
that's not, because that was a red shade of that mm -hmm. dioxazine instead of the really deep, deep one. That's the one thing Sharpen doesn't make a really deep dioxazine violet. They make some other one, some other violets that are uh, that are darker, like an ombre and stuff, but they don't make a, a deep dioxazine. Different different manufacturers make their colors different. Okay, so see how that looks definitely like a nice chromatic black there with that um, the phthalo red shade, blue red shade, and the brown. Let's see, this is gonna make because it's not a very dark green and it's not a dark red and a lizard crimson and like a sap green would make up. Remember how we uh, did our gouache sets guys? When we did those uh, watercolor gouache sets and we made the colors to do that chromatic. This is almost like a, that almost looks like a really deep red oxide, doesn't it? It's a nice, more of like an earth tone though, but that wouldn't read so well as that chromatic black. So you want those darker that's why it's a good thing to play with your colors. You want those darker colors that come across with a very deep, dark saturation that have a very dark value. See, if you put this up here, this has got about maybe a value of a two if you squint, okay? It's just, it's not as deep and dark as these colors. Rhiannon would like to know what would happen if you add white to your chromatic black? Uh, you, it would be much lighter. Let's. But will they turn a like more traditional gray, or will they... No, because they don't have any real black in it, right? So you're going to pick up some of the colors that are... It's a good question, Rihanna. She wanted to know if we added some white, what was going to happen with that? Would they, they turn more gray? This makes almost kind of a nice little violety color here. Look at that. That was the dioxazine and the... Reminds me of sugar plums. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a grayed lavender. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now this is coming almost back to the... You can see some of the brown undertone in it, but it's coming back kind of more to that. It's almost like Payne's gray looking... See how that little addition of white there kind of lightens that? It's a very grayed blue. Then with our red and green. It's almost like a, a raw umber color, isn't it? Hmm. So see, close to kind of some brands raw umber. Close to the kind of the Soho raw umber. See how that value change happened though? It's a big difference. You know, you're putting this up in the range of about here to here by adding that, and then this is down kind of in the middle of there. See? It's right about there to there. All right, are there any more questions, guys? All right, well, if you missed the other color theory episode, that was JL88, and we talked more about just that primary mixing. We used the Soho set that we had, and I just used the kind of the red, yellow, and blue that were in that set to make the, their Soho primary red, yellow, and blues um, to make that color wheel. And then today we've talked a little bit more about color temperature with our different colors. We've talked about kind of using that color temperature to get some different colors how the value changes, what tones, tints, and shades are. Um, have a wonderful week, and we will see you next Tuesday.